we're still looking at how the characteristics of atoms help determine chemical bonds. You might remember from the previous lesson that it has a lot to do with these outer energy levels. If these outer energy levels are full, the atom is stable, and if it's stable, then there's no chemical bonding. But often, atoms will share electrons or will donate electrons to form bonds, fill up those outer energy levels for stability. So here's an example of atoms donating electrons. Here's an example of atoms sharing electrons. When they do this, they form molecules and compounds. Sarah Matthews, an accountant, is sitting with her husband Tom, having their after-dinner coffee, and asks, Another cup, honey? No thanks. More than one seems to bother me these days, especially this late in the evening. Sarah is about to express her concern when their son, Tom, a high school junior, bursts in and says, Mom! Dad! Do you know what the pH is of that coffee you're drinking? Uh, what's pH? asked Tom. Come on, Dad. It's a measure of acidity, and coffee is like a pH of five. So what does that mean? Will it hurt me? Don't we eat other acid things? responds Tom. At this point, Sarah interjects. But I thought that neutral solutions like plain water are pH of 7, which doesn't seem very far from 5 to me. Yeah, right, Mom. pH 5 is only a 100 times more acidic than water. Or try that vinegar we put in our homemade salad dressing. It's around pH 3, a 100 times more acidic than this coffee is. His dad asks, I don't get it. How can uh, two units like the difference between 3 and 5 or 5 and 7 give you 100 times as much? Because, Dad, it's a log scale, you know, like earthquakes. And the two units mean two powers of 10, like 10 squared. And that's where the 100 comes from. Sarah chimes in. She's much better at math than Tom. So you mean if there were three pH units difference, that would be 10 cubed or a uh, thousand times? Or if you went from pH 3.7 to pH 6.7, then that would be a thousand fold. Now you're getting it. Whoa, slow down, Paul, replies Tom. You've got my head spinning. Besides, it's getting late and you have school tomorrow, so off to bed with you. Molecules and compounds can be acids and bases. So take, for example, Paul Matthews. He comes home one day, he sees his dad drinking some coffee, he sees his mom making dinner, and he had just learned about some chemistry things in class, and so he comes home and he says, Mom, don't you know that vinegar that you're using for dinner has a pH of 3? And Dad, that coffee that you're about to drink that has a pH of 5? And his mom and dad give him kind of a puzzled look. Um, Paul, I don't know if we know much about acids and bases. So we might ask ourselves those same questions. What is an acid? What is a base? What might be the pH of things like tomatoes, the things like cola or beer, the things like lemon juice, or even your stomach? What's the pH of those things? So first let's answer this question, what is an acid? An acid is anything that releases hydrogen ions in water. So notice this is an ion because it has a positive charge. That means it needs an electron for stability. So it's going to be seeking around, trying to steal electrons from whatever it can, sometimes very violently. And the strength is based on the number of hydrogen ions in that solution. So if there's a high concentration, if there are a lot of hydrogen ions in that solution, the pH, we would say, is very low. It's a very strong acid. So for example, hydrochloric acid is a strong acid because there's lots and lots and lots of hydrogen ions available for chemical bonding. We measure this by the pH scale. So let's take a look at that scale. What's that scale? Like. So a pH based on hydrogen ions, an acid typically will do what in water? In this case, 
lose the hydrogen. So here's the pH scale. Seven is neutral. Zero to six are acids. Eight to 14 are bases. Acids will be giving off hydrogen ions. Bases will be giving off hydroxide ions. You'll notice that water is neutral because H2O is water. That means the same number of hydrogen ions as hydroxide ions in water, so the pH is neutral. But if I have a lot of hydrogen ions, that makes it very acidic, a strong acid. A lot of OHs, that makes it very basic, a strong base. So things like hydrochloric acid, strong. Lemon juice, stomach acid, strong. Even things like cola. Tomatoes are a four. Coffee is a five. Down here, bleach is a 12. Sodium hydroxide, baking soda is here. Ammonia, seawater. Notice blood is slightly on the basic side. So blood has a few extra OHs than it does hydrogen ions. So blood, 7.2 to 7.4. And it's the kidneys that typically regulate the pH of blood. They're one of the main organs that help regulate with blood pH. The problem with pH, though, is a conceptual one. And that's because the scale we're looking at is a logarithmic scale. So when we go from 3 to 2, we're increasing by a power of 10. So, stomach acid is 10 times stronger than vinegar. It's 100 times stronger than tomatoes. It's 1,000 times stronger than black coffee. So stomach acid, very acidic. We have to remember, each time we move on the pH scale, we're going up by a factor of 10. So small differences in pH can lead to very big problems, especially for our human bodies. So how can we determine pH? Well, we have some common solutions. So here's some water, let's say, water, let's say, different solutions, some Sprite. Here, I do have some baking soda. So I'm going to mix a little bit of the baking soda in with, with the water. I'll stir that up a little bit. There's going to be some baking soda in that water. Into this beaker, I'm going to add a little bit of Sprite. And we'll test some of these pHs. All right, so there's some Sprite. When we test the pH of something, we can use a few different indicators. We can use litmus paper, we can use pH paper, we can use a universal indicator solution. So let's try these different methods, see how it works. For a pH paper, if it turns blue, we know that's a base. So blue is for bases. So I'm going to take my blue pH paper, dip it in with my baking soda, I get blue. I take my blue litmus paper, I dip it into my Sprite, I get pink or red. Red is indication acid. I take my litmus paper, my blue litmus paper, I dip it into my water and I've mixed some Alka-Seltzer in with the water and I get pink. I can do the same thing with red litmus paper. Red indicates an acid. So if I dip it in and it stays red, that means there's an acid. So here I am dipping it in to my baking soda, see how it turned blue, because blue indicates a base. Take my red litmus paper, dip it into Sprite, and it stays red. So anytime the result is red, you're looking at an acid. 
the result is blue, you're looking at a base. So what if blue paper stays blue and red paper stays red? What did you just dip that paper into? So blue stayed blue, red stayed red. What would show both an acid and a base? Well, something that's right in the middle, in this case, water. So for the litmus test, acids are red, bases turn blue. For a pH paper test, so if I was testing these two things right here, now I want to test with some pH paper. I can take out the strip of paper, and I compare it to a color scale on the side of the box. So I'm going to dip this paper into the Sprite. And then I just compare the colors to the side of the box. So I just compare the colors to the side of the box until I get a match for all four colors. In this case, the close match would be a 3. So that Sprite has a pH of 3. When I put the paper into the baking soda. Again, I just compare all four colors to the side of the box. Here, it looks still kind of green, so maybe a nine. So baking soda with a pH of nine. So my acid had a pH of three. In this case, it's soda. My base, a nine. My acid turn the litmus paper red, my base turns it blue. What about the indicator solution? How does indicator solution work? Well, in this case, we'll put a little drop of our acid into a tray. We'll put a little drop of our base into a tray. We'll add a little bit of an indicator solution and we'll see if they turn colors. So you'll notice that this one turns green, this one turns orange. So notice when we put the indicator solutions in, one is green, the other turns orange. So what do those colors mean? So you'll notice that a reddish orange color might give us a pH of 3, which is consistent with our Sprite. And a green color will give us a pH of 8 to 9, which is consistent with our baking soda. So notice one other thing with pH. Here I have the universal indicator solution. It's green. If I exhale into this, if I add carbon dioxide into that, notice what happens to the color. So here's my indicator solution. Watch what happens when I blow into it. Tail starts to turn to yellow, reddish colors. That's because now instead of being here in the blue greens, now it's turning here to the yellowish, reddish colors. All right, see that? So by adding carbon dioxide, I'm changing the pH of that solution. Right, I'm changing the pH of it. In this case. As it goes lower on the scale, it's making it more of an acid. So as carbon dioxide goes into the solution, it helps to form carbonic acid. The pH goes down. The pH number goes down. It means it's getting more acidic. Carbonic acid is formed. The next day brought a beautiful fall afternoon, and the maples were just starting to show their autumn colors. Sarah was enjoying her long late afternoon run and was only a few blocks away from home when she was surprised by the ringtone of her phone. 
Mom, it's Paul. Get home quick. I was on the computer downstairs, so I didn't hear Molly fall down in your bathroom. Even though she's only three, she must have managed to climb up onto the toilet seat and then the sink and then reach up to the medicine cabinet. She may have thought the pills were candy, and I think she started eating a whole bunch of aspirin tablets before she fell. Anyway, I heard her crying and went upstairs where I found her curled up and whimpering on the bathroom floor with colored pills and cracked bottles scattered all around her. I don't think she broke anything, but it does look like she threw up. Oh, she just threw up again, and this time on me. Hurry home, Mom. Sarah immediately called 911 for an ambulance, then shifted her running into high gear. Since Tom was at work across town, he couldn't come. Fueled by adrenaline, Sarah essentially sprinted the rest of the way home, her mind racing as her heart pounded, her lungs ached, and her legs burned from the effort. She berated herself for leaving Molly alone with Paul, not fixing the recently broken latch on the medicine cabinet and being so far from home without a car. She didn't know how many tablets of aspirin Molly had consumed. She recently read that a fatal dose for a child could be as little as 3 grams or 10 300 milligram tablets. By the time she arrived home a few minutes later, Molly seemed sleepy, almost lethargic, and Paul said she had vomited several times. Sarah thought that was good, since the bits of undissolved tablets could be seen. But just then the ambulance arrived, and after briefly checking Molly's status, they rushed her to the nearby hospital's emergency room. So here's Molly, she's a three-year-old. Her brother Paul is at home, finds her on the floor in the bathroom. She's eating lots and lots and lots of aspirin. So as Molly's mother runs home, so Molly's mother's out jogging around, let's say, taking a walk through the park. She gets a cell phone call. She runs home to see what the problem is. What's going to happen to the pH of her blood? So as she's running home, her body's breaking down sugar into carbon dioxide and water. So as that carbon dioxide is being added to the blood, just like the carbon dioxide was added to my indicator solution, what happened to the pH? right it goes down pH goes down so if her pH goes down what would be the effect of her breathing hard so now she's going to be breathing hard trying to get rid of that carbon dioxide so when you breathe out you breathe out that carbon dioxide and water so there she's breathing getting rid of all that carbon dioxide so as she or her body is getting rid of that carbon dioxide what happens to the pH then well as we lose the carbon dioxide then the pH will start to rise again so that's one of the main things, actually, that helps to regulate your breathing. As your carbon dioxide levels go up, your breathing gets faster to get rid of it, all because of your pH. As your carbon dioxide levels go down again, your body can be back into homeostasis. So what about breathing hard before an athletic event? Would that be an advantage? So if you're breathing hard, getting rid of a lot of the carbon dioxide, could that be an advantage? And the answer is... Yes. If you breathe hard before your athletic event, try to rid your body of a lot of carbon dioxide, then your body will be prepared and ready for that carbon dioxide buildup, and you won't have to worry about uh, relying so much on your breathing during your event, or at least at the beginning of your event. Sarah Matthews arrived in the emergency room with her daughter Molly, where the little girl immediately underwent a physical exam, and lab samples were obtained for analysis. By this time, she was almost unarousable, and her breathing rapidly and deeply. The physician on duty, Dr. Pedro Martinez, intubated Molly's trachea for airway protection and carried out hyperventilation, which he said was to avoid hypoventilation and a worsening of her metabolic acidosis. What does it have to do with aspirin? asked Sarah anxiously. Dr. Martinez replied, well, aspirin was originally a trademark for acetosalicylic acid, which can inhibit a pathway leading to inflammation, but it is also a weak organic acid. That means at high levels it can lower the pH of your blood from its normal value of about 7.4, and any level below about 7 begins to be dangerous. As you can see, the nurse is also starting to administer activated charcoal through a nasogastric tube to absorb any residual aspirin in Molly's stomach and prevent its entry into her bloodstream. Oh, said Sarah, our son Paul was trying to explain pH to my husband and I last night, but what do you mean dangerous? And 
what can you do to get it back up again? They were interrupted by another nurse who came in with lab results. Dr. Martinez frowned as he looked over the results. They revealed a pH of 6.8 and a plasma silicate level of 100 milligrams per deciliter, together with a number of other electrolyte abnormalities. He hadn't seen a pH that low for some time. It certainly explained Molly's rapid and deep respiration. So weak acids like carbonic acid, vinegar are ideal for the human body. Weak acids work out really well for us. So carbon dioxide plus water makes a little bit of carbonic acid. Here's where the hydrogen ion disassociates a little bit. So if we add carbon dioxide, we get more carbonic acid this way. Right, so the reaction goes this way. We have lots of carbonic acid. It goes this way. We have lots of hydrogens. Now it goes the opposite direction. So we can ionize. In other words, we can turn some of these compounds into ions, some of these elements into ions. If we have strong acids, it's too big. We can't handle it. There's too much hydrogen. It's too strong for our body. It begins to destroy our body. If we have small weak acids like water, which is just about neutral, it's not enough. Like We need a, to be able to drive this reaction one way or the other. So weak acids like carbonic acid and vinegar are just enough to drive the reaction one way or the other. So our body can maintain homeostasis. If we get strong acid, it's too much. If the acids are too weak, like water, too small, too insignificant, we can't get the changes that we need. But as long as we're working in weak acids inside of our body, we can maintain homeostasis fairly well. So Molly, the three-year-old, has ingested way too much aspirin. So she's eaten way too much aspirin. The problem is that the aspirin is an acid. And that's brought her to the emergency room because her blood pH levels have now dropped. And we can't survive if our blood pH levels get below 6.8 or over 8.0. So you might say, I know a solution right away then. If Molly's blood is too acidic, just like having the carbonic acid in it, if it's too acidic, what if we simply have her breathe hard? Would that help? Uh, might help, but let's find out. So a change from 7.4 to 8.4 is actually an increase, remember it's a logarithmic scale, of 10. Why is Molly, Molly breathing so rapidly and deeply when she arrives to the emergency room, despite being nearly comatose? Well, she's not out of breath. The aspirin hasn't inhibited her ability to use oxygen. It's not a problem with her blood delivering oxygen. But rather, if her body can get rid of carbon dioxide, it can help to regulate the pH. So now her blood's too acidic, getting rid of that carbon dioxide helps to raise the pH level. How about you raise the pH in Molly's blood to get it back to normal? So one thing we could do is try to get her to breathe hard, but she's already doing that. So we don't want to add a stronger acid. We don't want to add a too strong of a base because, again, our body can't deal with it. We don't want to add more aspirin, but if we can add some bicarbonate ions, we can help buffer that acid. We can drive the reaction the other direction. So as you just saw, bicarbonate helps with carbonic acid. So if carbonic acid uh, adds hydrogens, it makes bicarbonate. That's one of the products of it. So here again, we have our carbonic acid. The doctor immediately ordered emergency treatment with intravenous bicarbonate to correct the systemic acidosis. He ordered hydration, that is fluid replacement to compensate for Molly's vomiting, and hemodialysis to correct electrolyte imbalances and remove the dissolved aspirin from her body. He continued with his exploration to Sarah. We use bicarbonate, the same compound as in baking soda, as a buffer, that is, a substance that can combine with the acid ions, which you may know are protons in solution thus soaking them up to reduce the acidity and raise the pH. 
One of the good things about bicarbonate is that it is a natural substance. Your body is in fact normally making moderate amounts of bicarbonate all the time. And that is how the carbon dioxide produced in your tissues by metabolism is transported to your lungs to be exhaled. In fact, bicarbonate is produced whenever you dissolve carbon dioxide in water. But hydrogen ions are also produced, which makes the solution more acidic. I can show you the simple formula indicating the chemical equilibrium, or perhaps you'd like to ask your son Paul to do it. They saw that Molly's breathing was returning to a more normal rate and breathe a collective sigh of relief. She's out of danger now, but we'll have to keep a close eye on her for a while yet, said Dr. Martinez. Sarah, however, was still curious, and she asked, So, does that mean when you remove carbon dioxide from a solution, it becomes less acidic and the pH goes back up? Wow, Mrs. Matthews, replied Dr. Martinez, you'd make a terrific chemist. And that's why Molly's breathing was that way her body was trying to raise its pH by getting rid of its carbon dioxide as best as it could even though it really didn't help much because the problem was really the aspirin and she couldn't get rid of it the doctor answered yes and in medical terminology we call that the difference between metabolic acidosis which is Molly's problem lots of acidic compounds in her bloodstream and respiratory acidosis which can occur if too much dissolved carbon dioxide builds up there but that must mean that in your tissues where metabolism is going on and resulting in all that carbon dioxide in water and where the pH is lower than your lungs, that's got to be where the body is getting rid of carbon dioxide. But is that why my leg muscles got so sore after my 10 minute sprint home this afternoon? I've always thought it was from lactic acid buildup. Dr. Martinez answered, well you're correct on the first count that the low pH from lactic acid not from carbon dioxide is the problem in the second instance. But my pager is going off, and I have to rush over to check on another patient. Molly will be fine, but don't hesitate to call me if you have any further questions and fix the latch on your medical cabinet. And it would drive the reaction to make more carbon dioxide and water. As we make more carbon dioxide and water, that we can help regulate our pH. Breathe out that carbon dioxide, get rid of that, keep the reaction going in this direction until we get it the body's pH back to normal. How can this help Molly? Well, one of the main things is, is that the pH of her blood will begin to rise. Here's how. As she's breathing the carbon dioxide, getting rid of the carbon dioxide, we're driving that reaction this way, we're unable to make as much carbonic acid. We're unable to make as much carbonic acid. Without that carbonic acid, the pH of the blood begins to rise back into the normal range. And that's going to help Molly feel much better and get her out of some danger. So by adding that bicarbonate, we're going to help, here again, we add this bicarbonate, we're going to help drive the reaction this way. We can she can breathe out that carbon dioxide, she breathes out that carbon dioxide, she can feel better, get out of danger. Now pH is important for enzymes to function optimally. Remember, enzymes are just proteins. Here's the problem. We can add acids and bases to enzymes, bad things happen. Just like when we add acids to proteins, bad things happen to the protein. The protein starts to break down. So for example, a little trick for all you hunters out there, adding a little bit of vinegar, which is a weak acid, to your marinade when you're marinating your deer steak will help tenderize that steak because the proteins start to break down. Same thing here. pH is important for enzymes to operate normally. So as long as the pH is normal and the normal ranges, the enzymes are fine. If the pH gets too strong, however, the enzymes start to break down. So we want to make sure that those enzymes work in that narrow range. So we have buffers in our body that are essential for keeping that pH range optimal. So for example, in our stomach, which is, has a very low pH of 1, we have enzymes in our stomach. So how do you go from a pH of 1 to 7 from your stomach to your small intestine? 
One of the functions of the pancreas is to release a bicarbonate buffer that helps to neutralize the pHs of the stomach and allow that food to travel through the small intestine without giving you intestinal ulcers. change much. So it helps keep the pH within a range that's acceptable. What happens to the pH of the solution when you dissolve carbon dioxide in it? There's a big hint. The pH goes down, more acidic. It becomes more acidic. Why do Sarah's legs burn at the end of her run home? So the mother's running home Oh, her legs start to feel this burning sensation. Why is that? Well, we've added an acid. In this case, one of the products of using your muscles is lactic acid. So if you build up lactic acid, you feel a burn in your muscles. If you build up lactic acid, you feel a burn in your muscles. So lactic acid is one of the byproducts of working out your muscles the result of that is feeling the burn. So there you are, like lifting weights, and like, oh, feel the burn, feel the burn. Oh, you feel the burn in your muscles. That's one of the side effects of acids. Acids burn because of those electrons being stripped from anything to cause that atom of hydrogen to have some stability. 